If you've got your Bibles, you'll turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And again, you can look on the Version app, check events, and you'll find the sermon notes uh, for tonight or tonight's message, the notes that are there for that. James is a very practical book, if you will. In fact, the Bible is very practical. It's not just theoretical. It's theory that applies to our lives. And James has been really called the handbook of Christianity, if you will, or the handbook of living faith. And the fact that if we say we believe like we should, then do we behave like we should? And James counseled at the very beginning of his letter to the church, to Jewish believers, and we find in verses 1 through 5, and his counsel now at the closing of this letter, they're the same regarding those who are suffering trials. Suffering trials because of their living faith in Christ. And James' counsel as it was at the very beginning... And now here at the end, his counsel is this, be patient. Be patient. Now, if you're going through something and somebody comes up to you and tells you to be patient, what are you going to (laughs) do? Probably going to want to smack them, (laughs) right? (laughs) I didn't need to hear that. (laughs) That's not what I wanted to hear, but that is James counsel from the very beginning. At the very beginning of his letter, he's talking about trials that we as believers will face. You don't have to wonder if you're going to face difficulties. We're going to face difficulties. And now at the close of his letter to the believers, he's reminding them again the same thing. You're going to face difficulties and what we're to do and how we're to react as God's people is we have to be, God calls us to be and enables us to be patient. So let's look at verses 7 through 11. We're going to read it all together tonight and then go back and look. James says this, verse 7, Therefore be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, against one another, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. That the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Father, we just thank you again for your word. Open our hearts by the means of Holy Spirit that we may receive your word implanted into our hearts. That it may sprout forth and produce the fruit of righteousness, the character of Christ, the fruit of Holy Spirit in us. So that, Lord, it would be a witness and a blessing to others for your glory and the advancement of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we haven't come to grips with this yet, we're going to have to. And that is the fact that God is not going to right all the wrongs in this world until Christ returns. He's not going to right all the wrongs that are within this world until Christ returns. Why? Because God is extending grace. He's extending grace to those who are living apart from Christ and are still living in their sin. He's extending grace. And as believers, we must patiently endure and expect trying times while we draw breath on this earth. In fact, as we've read verses 7 through 11 of chapter 5, we find that three times James reminds us in the midst of calling us to be patient, he reminds us about the coming of the Lord. In verses 7, in verse 8, and verse 9, three times. Because the return of Christ is our hope. It is, as we say in our fellowship, our blessed hope. 
Not something that we're wishing for because that's, what, that's not what that term hope in the Bible means. It's something that is assured. It is something that is guaranteed. It will happen. That's why we call it our blessed hope. And in fact, Paul, at the end of his life, in writing what we call the pastoral epistles, is writing to his young minister that he was a mentor to or is a mentor to, and it says in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do not expect, or we should not expect as believers, to have everything easy, to have everything comfortable in this present life. We have to remember that we are not living for what we have here in this physical world. In fact, individuals may say, well, as a believer, if things don't become easy and comfortable, why should I give my life to Christ? Because I'm already miserable now. Well, the difference is when we become a believer, the weight that we have to carry in this life, we don't carry it, the Lord does. Because we are yoked with him. And in those trying times, whether they come from the enemy, whether they just because we're living among sinful people, or the Lord is testing us, in other words, he's building our faith, we understand that if we place our lives in God's hands, God takes it, even if it's meant for our destruction, and he actually turns it for our good. That's his promise. And his promises for us in Christ Jesus are yes and what? Amen. It's resolved. That if we give it into God's hands, God will take something that the enemy meant to destroy us and he will actually build and affirm our faith. We're striving not for this life, but we're striving for living in eternity with God in his everlasting kingdom. But until that glorious day when we see him and we become like him, as Paul says, in his nature... And as Peter speaks of that as well, we will face difficulties as disciples of Christ. We've alluded to this scripture many times in John 16, 33, Jesus on the last night that he would spend with his disciples before he was betrayed, before he was beaten, before he was falsely accused and crucified. On that last night, he told them, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation The Lord says, take courage, I have overcome the world. In fact, Paul reminds us as he reminds new believers that have come to faith in Christ in Acts 14.22 that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Many tribulations. So therefore, God repeatedly in his word affirms to us and tells us and calls us as his children to patiently endure hardship and heartaches until Jesus returns. And that is the focus of verses 7 through 11, be patient while you're suffering. And what's interesting is we're going to dissect these verses, what we find is James uses two different words in the Greek that is translated to us as patience. We find in verses 7, 8, as well as verse 10, that James uses a word in the Greek that means to be long-tempered. So when we read in verse 7, when he says for us to be patient, be patient, he says, and then He affirms it again with the farmer, being patient. And then also, as we continue to look in verse 10, he talks about the concept of patience in suffering. These words there that are translated for us as patience, it means to be long-tempered. And those words carry the meaning of being patient in bearing the offenses and injuries that others would hurl our way through their actions or through their words. It means to be mild and slow in avenging. It means to be long-suffering. It takes us a long time to get angry, and we are slow to retaliate or punish. Long-tempered. Because we've placed our lives in God's hands. And then in verse 11, James uses a different word. 
which literally means to remain under, and it speaks of endurance through great suffering or great stress. And that verse, in, or that word in verse 11, where James uses the example of Job, it carries the meaning of being of a long spirit. In other words, we don't lose heart. We're able to get through it and endure it. It's a word that speaks to persevering patiently and bravely and enduring misfortune and troubles that come our way. In fact, I like how the late Pastor Warren Worsby defined patience. He said, patience is staying put and standing firm when we'd like to run away. Staying put, standing fast and firm when we would like to run away. We understand what James is speaking here. That when he tells us to be patient, that what he is speaking of is something that is faith-inspired. It is a faith-inspired response to the variety of circumstances that we will face as Christ followers. It's as a result of our faith in Christ that we're able to endure, that we're able to be patient, that we're able to be long-tempered. It's because of Christ in us. And the first illustration to get his point of cross, of what he's referring to in telling us to be patient while we are suffering, the first illustration that he uses in verse 7 is that of a farmer. A farmer who waits patiently for the fall as well as the spring rains. Verse 7 again, let's look at it. Therefore be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soul, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Now, if we just kind of study into what the early and the late rains and and what it's referring to in the cultural time period in the first century, we find that in Palestine, the early rains came somewhere around October and November. That was late fall. Soon after the grain was sown, the rains came to help germinate that seed. And the latter rains came somewhere between April and May, early spring, so that the grain, when it germinated, would begin to take root and mature. And what James is telling us is that both rainy seasons were necessary for a successful crop. In order for there to be a harvest, they needed both rains. And James says that the farmer, knowing this, he waits patiently until both rains came and provided the needed moisture so that there could be a complete harvest. And what he's telling us is that as believers, we are called to wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord. Now, we understand that when he's talking about waiting, he's not talking about us sitting in the corner at a doctor's office kind of twiddling our thumbs. You know, nervous energy as we're just sitting there doing nothing. Wait is not inaction. Wait is action of faith in seeking God's face so that he can lead us and guide us. And James says, as believers, we are to wait on the Lord. And when we are faced with suffering, we are to patiently wait on the Lord to work out his purpose and to work out his plans like the example of the farmer. Because being patient in negative circumstances It means we deliberately, it is a deliberate action of faith that allows God to handle the situation in his own way and his own time, and we can all say, that's not easy. Is that easy? There's nothing easy about that. But if we're going to grow, if we're going to mature, it's not going to be easy. And so be impatient. In negative circumstances, means that there is a deliberate action of faith upon us that allows God to handle the situation in His time and in His way. And what's interesting is when we look, because we understand that the first century believers, they had these letters, but they did not have the Scriptures as we have today. Now, they had the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, or they had, you know, the Old Testament in the Hebrew. They had those scriptures, but they had the letters that were passed around that we're reading one and studying one tonight. 
What's interesting is when we go back and we look to this reference in the Bible as a whole of early and latter rains, especially when we go back and we look in the Old Testament, what we find is that these references to the early and the latter rain in the Old Testament occur in the context in affirming the faithfulness of God. God will be faithful. And what is interesting, even in the midst, and I'm not trying to preach unfaithfulness on our part, But I'm just talking about the amazing God that we serve. That even in the midst of Israel's unfaithfulness, God was faithful. In Jeremiah 5, in verse 24, in the Lord reprimanding his people for their unfaithfulness, he says this, You say within your heart, or you do not say within your heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of harvest. In other words, God is faithful. God is faithful. And what we find in the illustration of the wise farmer here is that the farmer has learned to wait patiently for the harvest. To allow the early rain to come and to germinate the seed and let it put down roots. And wait and allow the latter rain to come so that it may fully produce the stalk. And then the grain comes so that there can be an abundant harvest. The wise farmer has learned to wait. And so James is affirming to us and telling us we, we should wait as well. Now, when we're reading about the whole concept of the early rain, of the latter rain, we should not read too much into the time of the rains in searching for some sort of eschological signs. We don't need to read too much and try to find something there. Because the framework of James and keeping in with its context of just being so practical, living out our faith in a practical way and producing fruit for the glory of God and proving that Christ is in us, the framework of James is definitely uh, eschological and talking about the end times, the return of the Lord, but life until the return of Christ is to be characterized by heavenly wisdom that is to produce mature faith in our lives as believers. That's what James is all about. It is all about that as we're waiting for the return of our Lord, and we know that it's assured, our lives will be characterized not by earthly wisdom, but heavenly wisdom that produces mature faith in our lives as believers as we witness of the truth of who our Christ or who Christ is. So therefore, as seen in the wisdom of the farmer, James says, As believers, we must wait patiently. And he gives an imperative, an imperative command in verse 8. Look at verse 8 again when he tells us, and given the example of the farmer, he says then too, be patient. As the farmer is patient, you be patient. And then notice what he says, in our patience, he says, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Strengthen our hearts. In other words, James is calling for us to confirm our faith through our patient endurance. James is all about, let me show you my faith through my works. And so here again, he is saying, and he is calling for us to confirm our living faith through our patience in enduring suffering as we are waiting for the coming of Christ. This phrase, strengthen our hearts, James is referring to an emotional fortitude, an inner disposition, uh, disp- disposition in the Lord. In fact, this verb has the idea of providing solid support. Our patient endurance provides solid support for our faith in Christ. This verb speaks of establishing an individual and enabling them to stand unmoved by trouble. So when we are under duress, our hearts can grow heavy. Amen? Our hearts grow heavy. And the Lord understands that and He sees that and He's not indifferent to it. But God has placed His Spirit within us. May we not forget 
As Paul told Timothy at the end of his life again, he says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but he has given you a spirit of power, of his love that brings a soundness of mind, heart, and life in the way that we walk. Holy Spirit lightens the load of our heart that is weighed down by the pressures that we face. I can, one of the, we all have stories within our lives, but I remember one night and I was in college at CVCC, we lived in Smith Station, and one night I was praying in, in, in front of my bed and there was just something, just a weight. I mean, you guys, you know, you can feel it. When you're just burdened in your spirit, you can just physically feel it. You're just down, and I was down, and I was pressed down, and I just knelt in front of my bed, and I just prayed, and I prayed, and I continued to pray, and I continued to pray, and then I just began to worship, and I don't know how long it was. It it was quite some time, and I don't know how long it was, but I literally, I can remember right there at the foot of my bed, I can visually see it, that the Lord literally reached down, and I physically felt him lift the burden. Have you been there? Just to physically, as we seek the Lord and ask for that patient endurance, the Lord just reaches down and lifts the burden. You can physically feel that manifestation of the Spirit of God within your life. That's what James is speaking to in strengthening our hearts. Strengthening our hearts. Because we understand in James saying in verse 8, and I'm moving on, that the Lord's return can happen at any moment. At any moment, it it, it can take place. And so it speaks of the necessity of us constantly being ready and preserving in faith until He comes. And that doesn't mean just sitting in the corner and buying our time until Christ returns. It means actively engaging our world with the gospel of Christ as we are bearing witness of the truth. The confidence that the Lord will return to set things right according to His will is what undergirds our hearts and makes it strong. And that's why He says in verse 8, You be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. And then we come to verse 9, and at first glance, verse 9 doesn't seem to, to really fit in the context, does it? I mean, if you read it before and then you read verse 9 and say, Man, how does that fit? into what James is talking about here, about enduring trials with patience or enduring suffering with patience. We understand the whole concept of the emphasis of the eminence of judgment when the Lord returns, but how does it fit into the context of Him calling us to be patient in suffering? Let's look at verse 9 again. He says, Do not complain, brothers and sisters. So we know He's talking to believers. Do not complain against one another within the body of Christ, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at your door. When we think about it, grumbling against one another is a temptation that accompanies the pressures of difficult circumstances if we're not careful. How often do I, how often can we find ourselves taking our frustrations of a difficult day out on others, whether it be a close friend or whether it be a family member. And reframing from this kind of complaining that James is talking about or grumbling can be seen, he says, as an aspect of patience, of the fruit of Holy Spirit, the character of Christ in our lives. Not complaining, not grumbling against one another in the context of the body, And I'm not talking about going and sharing with an individual something that you're going through for the purpose of praying together. That's not what James is talking about at all. But he's talking about grumbling. He's talking about complaining. He's talking about almost lashing out because we are going through a difficult circumstance. James has been speaking to his entire audience, which includes us, about our patient waiting together. And now he is reminding us not to grumble and not to complain when we are facing difficulties, when we are suffering for the cause of Christ. 
And this caution would limit the kind of rivalry that can flare up under difficult circumstances. And James's context shows that if believers were to endure their sufferings, they would do it together. Together. A lot of times when we're weak, our brother or sister may be, be a little stronger. And they can do exactly what Paul says in Galatians, let's bear one another. But in other words, we get up under our brother or sister and help them to bear. Trials are better endured with the encouragement of community than in solitude. Because the enemy wants to get us in solitude away from everyone else because he's got us right where he needs us. Because then we turn inward and we can become soured by our circumstances. Where if we draw together, then we can help one another walk through the difficulties. And it's important for us to remember the Lord's concern for us and not to fail to uphold one another in the faith. So that first illustration, and we see how verse 9 just ties in with that. And then the final two illustrations, we'll move through it quickly, of patient endurance. The second one. He uses in verse 10 about the prophets of old. And as we read through the Old Testament, many of the prophets we understand and we read had to endure great trials. They had to endure great suffering, not only at the hand of unbelievers, but at so-called professing believers. Those that were supposed to be worshipers of God. Jeremiah was arrested as a traitor and even thrown into an abandoned well to die. But yet God fed Jeremiah and protected him throughout that terrible siege of the Babylonian Empire against Jerusalem, even though at times it looked like the prophet was going to be killed. Both Ezekiel and Daniel had their share of hardships, but the Lord delivered them out of them. And even those who were not delivered, those who died in their faith, we understand received the special reward of those who who were true to the Lord even to the point of death. And this example that James uses of the Old Testament prophets, it should encourage us. And it should encourage us to spend more time within the Word of God, getting acquainted with those who we would call heroes of the faith. And even Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of, in fact, Paul says this in Romans 15 and verse 4, For everything was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Faith comes from what? Hearing the Word. From the Word. And the better we know the Bible, God's Word, the more God can encourage us in difficult experiences of life through that that others have gone through. And we can see God's faithfulness there. And He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He will be faithful to us as well. And the important thing is that like the farmer, we keep working. Waiting doesn't mean we just sit on the front porch in the rocking chair hoping the seed comes up. Hoping that we'll have a good harvest. But the farmer kept working and waiting for the early rains and the latter rains so that he could have a harvest. The important thing is we're like the farmer. We keep working and then we're like the prophets that he speaks of in verse 10. We keep witnessing no matter how trying the circumstances may be. And the final example that he gives in verse 11 is that of Job. In fact, it is difficult to find a greater example, isn't it? It's difficult for us to find a greater example of suffering than Job. Circumstances were against Job. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He lost his children. Even his wife was against him because she told him, why don't you just curse God So God can put you out of your misery. Job 2 and verse 9. In fact, we find when he makes his way to the city dump, that his friends or his so-called friends come and they're against him as well. They begin to accuse him of what? Of being a hypocrite. 
and that he was deserving of God's judgment, and it seemed like God was even against him. I mean, let's put ourselves in Job's position. God hasn't spoken. God hasn't said anything. God is silent. All these things have happened. We know we haven't sinned. We've lost all these things. Our wife says, you just need to curse God and die. Let God put you out of your misery. And then your so-called friends, your best buddies come and just tell you, you know what, Joe? We've come to the conclusion you're a hypocrite. And you need to repent of your sins. And then you're wondering, where is God in all this? As you read Job, don't you, doesn't that go through your mind? Where is God? Now, we can see it. We know it because we're reading it. We know the end of the End of, end of the book. But Job is asking that question, where is God? Is God against me? And when Job cried out for answers to his question, there was no reply. Yet, what did Job do? Job endured. Job endured. Satan predicted that Job would get impatient with God and abandon his faith, but that did not happen. He didn't. Job never abandoned his faith. He was questioning God why, but he never abandoned his faith. And the key point is that in all of his trials, Job maintained his integrity. And this integrity, in spite of the trials, is what was found most pleasing to the Lord. Through all that Job went through at the end of it all, by keeping faith in the Lord, he met God in a new and deeper way than he would have never experienced had he not gone through what he went through. In fact, you version, I've got it there for you, and they'll put it up on the screen, but let's read from Job chapter 40, just the first six verses. Just the conversation. Then the Lord said to Job, when God finally spoke, will the fault finder, Job is the fault finder. Job's been saying, God, this isn't fair. I haven't done anything. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who rebukes God give an answer. So Job gives an answer to the Lord. Behold, I am insignificant. What can I say in response to you? I put my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply or twice and I will add nothing more. And then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. And he spoke to him. And what we find in this encounter with the Lord that Job was overwhelmed by this new revelation of God. He now had a better understanding of how limited human knowledge is compared to God's boundless and all-knowing wisdom. And Job found himself speechless before God. And he begins to realize that his mysterious sufferings had not been a mystery to God. And that through it all, he could trust the Lord. Because what did God do? What did the Lord do? And we go back and, and we read verse 11 of James. What does James tell us happened? Verse 11 tells us, We count those blessed who endured, who have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. And what was God's outcome with Job? God's outcome with Job was that the Lord showed compassion And he showed mercy, compassion and mercy. And Job would have never experienced who God was in that magnitude had he not gone through the trials. And as we review this section and we close out tonight and just come to a place of the altar, we can see the practicality of it all. James wanted to encourage us. He wants to encourage us to be patient in times of suffering. That just like the farmer, we are waiting for a spiritual harvest, for fruit that will glorify the Lord. And like the prophets, we look for opportunities for witnessing, to share the truth of who God is. But how can we fully share the truth of who God is unless we are walking through life and experiencing the reality of who God is? 
As we, we are walking through these troubles and we are walking through these trials, does not the Word of God become living and powerful to us because we are literally fleshing the Scriptures out? We see that God is an individual of His Word and He does the things that He says He will do for His children when they patiently endure and they keep faith in Him. And like Job, we wait for the Lord to fulfill His loving purpose knowing that He will never cause us as His children to suffer needlessly. And like Job, we can have a clearer vision of the Lord And we can come to know him better from having been in the furnace of affliction. I'm learning in my life the truth that as I grow deeper with the Lord, my trials grow deeper too. But in the deepness of those trials and what seems like an intense furnace, I find God in greater intensity. So Job says as we suffer in an unjust world while we're waiting on the Lord to come back be patient in other words put it in God's hands place it in the Lord's hands that we are not to avenge ourselves or or try to do something no Lord I place it in your hands because I want my actions my reactions to be redemptive redemptive in my life and redemptive in others' lives as well. And Lord, whatever I'm walking through, I know this, that I place it in your hands that you will fortify my faith and strengthen me so that I can be a greater witness of who you are. Father, as we come before you tonight, oh God, as we end the service, Lord, I just pray that your word, as I already have, God, would just speak to us. Lord, your word does not just speak of something that is far off. But Lord, I just pray that the word would draw nigh. That Lord, it would be personal. That you would speak to us, Father, out of the context of your word into our life situation. As James is saying, that's what living out faith is. Is that the context of scripture becomes our life. That we're living it. We're walking it. It's not just something on a printed page. But it's something as you have affirmed through Christ that is written on the tablets of our heart. We flesh the word out. Lord, I just pray God speak to our hearts and speak to our lives tonight. Lord, as we come, Lord, just to this place of yielding ourselves to you. Are you walking through a difficult time? You're walking through a difficult time and you need the Lord to do exactly what James says here, to strengthen your heart so that you can be patient and you can lay it in the Lord's hands so that He can do in you what He desires to do in you as well as through you what He desires to do through you. If that's you tonight, if you don't mind, not wanting to embarrass anyone, you want to just, just stand where you are? Anybody be willing to do that? I'm just going through a difficult season. I'm going through a trying time. And I just need the Lord. Just, just stand where you are. And I'm just going to ask as these individuals stand, you that aren't standing, would you gather around them tonight? Come on, as they're standing. Come on, just move out. Just look around. Move out from where you are. And just begin to gather around these tonight. Come on, just move out from where you are. We've got individuals on this side as well, some up here at the front, have some of the ladies to come up here up to the front, or some of the guys just up here. Come on guys, let's pray together. Father, Lord, we just come before you now. Your word is true. Your word is true. And through the truth of your word, we are able to overcome, Lord, the tactics of the enemy. That's what Paul says. It is by our ignorance that the enemy is able to overcome us. 
But through the truth of your word, we can see the lies and we can see the deception of the enemy and not only see his lies and his deception, but Lord, we literally have the sword of the Spirit that we are able to slay his lies. We are able to press them back because of your living truth that is within us. It is through your truth, even as Revelation says, through the confession of our faith that we overcome. And Lord, I just pray tonight for these that are standing, that have acknowledged, oh God, Lord, in fact, you already know, God, you already see what they're walking through, oh Lord. And Lord, you already have the answer. And Lord, by them standing tonight, they're saying, Lord, I am placing it in your hands. And God, I want to live according to what your word says. I want to live according to your promise that, Lord, I am able as your child to patiently endure. I am able, Lord, even as James says, to allow endurance to have its full work in me so that my faith is grown and I can experience you through your word coming alive and being powerful in me in a brand new, deep, and more god real way oh father you know individually for each one what they're walking through and lord you are true and you are faithful lord and i just pray that you would sin you would send the early and the latter rain upon your children's life tonight lord send the early and the latter rain oh god lord to bring refreshing oh lord and renewal in their spirits and in their minds. Send, Lord God, the early and latter rain. God, lavish your faithfulness, Lord, upon them tonight. Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray. Oh, God, that they would leave this place encouraged. Because there isn't complaint. Lord, there isn't, Father God, grumbling going on. Lord, there is the body coming together and supporting one another. And Lord, I just pray that as their brothers and sisters are gathering around them and praying right now, that God, your love and your strength would just flow through them as vessels, living vessels of your grace and your mercy by us coming together, not grumbling, not complaining, but supporting one another in the name of Christ, that it would flow from your children to their brothers and sisters tonight and be a point of contact, O oh Lord of heaven, that, Lord, these individuals may leave encouraged and strengthened in you. I pray that over them. Strengthen their hearts. Strengthen their hearts, Lord. Strengthen their hearts. The enemy is a liar. May the truth of your word strengthen their hearts.